Merry Christmas to Mississippi Avenue. Please stand as we sing some Christmas carols, starting, starting with angels from the realms of glory.
Christmas, everybody. Hear the prayer? Was that okay? You had to listen a little closer. Yeah, I could use my uh, screaming during a uh, mission trip gone wrong voice, but that wouldn't have <laughs> that wouldn't have been very effective. Uh, if you're a guest here at Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church, we ask that you do us a favor. On the side of the bulletin is a tear-off section that we ask that you put uh, your name and all the information you feel comfortable about. We will not. Uh, hunt you up on e uh, on Google or anything like that. So just, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just put uh, some information there. And then the offering plate is passed. We ask that you just drop that in there. We'll have a record of your attendance. And uh, we'd like to get in contact with you later on during the week. Also, if you have a prayer or praise, uh, and you just write it in at the bottom, on Tuesday, staff will uh, pray for those uh, concerns and give God glory for what he has done uh, throughout um, our community and our family. The um, time right now is to stand up and shake hands and smile. And we need to practice smiling sometimes. You know, sometimes we kind of look like it's been a rough week. Okay. All right. Everybody's okay. I see some Jerry. All right. Very good. So, <laughs> got to check on Jerry every once in a while back there. So we're gonna have a fellowship time. We will not have a children's time, and uh, cause the uh, Advent uh, candle lighting will take place after this. So let's have time for fellowship. Please be seated. Six months, the angel Gabriel to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of meaning this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Luke 1, 26-38. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, Lord, hear your children pray, and ransom captive Israel, 
Church family, would you please stand with us as the Maranatha handbells lead us in O Come All Ye Faithful. Amen. Amen. Isn't it so amazing that we have, we have a lot of talent in this church, folks. We have a full choir. We have a robust orchestra. We have a tech team back there that runs everything. And not only that, we have a kids program that sings, as you'll see next week. And we have a handbell section. God has blessed this church. He's going to be, he, there is so much in store for us in the future. Can I get, can I get an amen? amen. We're going to sing another Christmas carol at this point. We're going to sing Away in the Manger. It's one of my favorites.
one on Midnight Clear. It came upon a midnight clear, that glorious song of old. From angels bending near the earth to touch their hearts of gold. He sung the earth good will to men from heaven's all gracious scheme. The world in solemn still. Good morning. So glad to be here with you on uh, just this, you know, warm December day, right? It's about to get cold. So I heard a yay. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to feel about it. So that's good. <laughs> that's good. Just, just wanted to give you a quick update um, on the Empower offering. God has been good. We have this goal of raising 100000 in 100 days, uh, and we are at, or we're near 29000 after three Sundays, uh, giving us 12 Sundays left. So we, we have plenty of time left, so let's thank God for what He's done. We're going to ask for you to continue to give to it as uh, 40% uh, is going to go to expand on our children's ministry, 10%. Uh, is going to be given away to missions, and 50% is just to go to whittle away uh, at our debt. Now, this year, uh, if you've looked ahead at your calendar, uh, you're going to see that Christmas is, sits a little bit different 
uh, this year because it lands on a Sunday. Uh, meaning that, obviously, Christmas Eve is on a Saturday night. And I, and I understand uh, that it's our tradition to have a Christmas Eve service. We're excited about that. Uh, and so what we're going to do, what we've decided is that we think that the vast majority of people uh, are going to give to us either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. Uh, because it sits on a Saturday and a Sunday, we don't think uh, that the majority of people are going to give us both days. So what we're going to do is if... Uh, we're going to make those two services identical. Uh, so we're going to say that basically the Christmas weekend, that we're going to have two services. The Christmas Eve service is going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, the Christmas Day service is going to be at 11 a.m. No, uh, no Sunday school that day. Uh, and so we think that you're going to pick one. And that's what we want to encourage you to do. We want to, we're going to encourage you to pick one, either Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, whatever uh, whatever fits into your schedule best. That's what my family is going to do, is they're going to pick one. Uh, so we're going to encourage you to come. They're going to be identical. We'll have a welcome. All those things that you might have uh, in a normal Sunday morning service. So we'll have a welcome. Uh, we're going to have caroling. We're going to have candlelight. Uh, we're going to have a brief message. Amen. Uh, and we're going to have an offering at both services. So we, we're going to acknowledge just sort of the awkwardness of that. Uh, at a Christmas Eve service that we're going to have an offering, but uh, because we think people are going to attend that and then not come back Sunday morning, uh, we're going to give an opportunity to people to worship through their tithe. So if you want to come uh, to both, you are welcome to. We're not going to check your attendance card and see which one you attend. Uh, if you want to come to both, that's great, uh, but we really want to encourage you to invite a friend. So invite somebody to attend uh, with you uh, on one of those two services. Uh, we're, con we're continuing this morning in our Christmas sermon series called Love Came Down. So let me encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. Uh, we're going to start in verse 26. Let me ask you, have you, have you ever seen um, those, and I don't know what the right word is for it, because it's not really a toy, uh, sort of those devices uh, that sit on a desk, right? It's usually a very important person's desk, because they must be pretty expensive. Uh, but what they have is they have those sort of um, hanging from a string, a metal sphere. Right? There's like five or six in a row. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Yes, that swing back and forth. Somebody said the name of it. Um, now, I know that they sit on the desks of important people, like the vice principal. Um, they sit on his desk. Uh, I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but I do know that he had one. And the idea is that if you, if you swing one at one end, right, it's going to swing out and it's going to hit the next sphere uh, and then it's going to cause the sphere at the other end to swing out, right? So it's just sort of almost like a perpetual motion sort of device. So one swings out one way and the other swings out the other way and it seems like the ones in the middle don't move at all. The reason why I bring this up is because today uh, Mary, Jesus' mom, uh, is going to feature prominently in our passage. And some use this passage, and they sort of they swing out way far in one direction. And they say that uh, based on really what is, what is written here, just in this passage, um, that Mary is either divine or near divine. So they swing way out in one direction. And, and in response, you have the equal swinging out the other way that says, no, nothing special about Mary at all. And I, and I think both of these are wrong. Mary was not divine, or even close to divine, nor is she insignificant. Mary was remarkable. This passage shows just how remarkable she is. She was remarkable in regards to her response, to the responsibility given to her as the mother of Jesus Christ. So with that in mind, let me ask you to read along with me in Luke 1, 26 through 38. It says, In the sixth month, the angel, angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he, Gabriel, came to her and said, Greeting, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at this saying, 
and try to discern what sort of greeting this might be. The angel says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of this kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child will be born, will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the promise of salvation that you sent through your Son. We thank you that you sent him to deliver us from our sin and our shame, to overcome evil, and to offer us a path to relationship with you. We thank you that Mary was such a willing recipient and that you miraculously put your Son inside of her. So we thank you that she responded in such a way that inspires us today. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So the angel, the angel Gabriel, is, is active in this very, very first chapter of the book of Luke. At the beginning, Gabriel appears to Zechariah and announced that a miracle is coming. For Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth will have a baby in their old age. Previously, as you can see, they were not able to have any kids. So Gabriel appears first to Zechariah in the temple and announces that Zechariah and Elizabeth will be expecting a son. And we know who this son, he's the very first Baptist. His name was John. Now from appearing to Zechariah, he goes from appearing to Zechariah, a priest in the beautiful, the sort of majestic, the pious, the holy setting of the temple. He then goes into a humble setting in a no-name town to visit with a lady that would have just passed through history without anyone knowing her name. So he appears in a very humble setting to a woman named Mary. The humble nature of this announcement parallels the humble nature of Jesus and his birth. Gabriel appears to Mary, and we can see in verse 28, he says to her, Greetings, O favored one, In verse 28, the Lord is with you. He follows this up in verse 30 when he says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. What we need to be clear of, this is the swinging in the wrong direction, swinging too far in the wrong direction, is that Gabriel is not saying to her, Hail Mary, full of grace, as though she was capable of giving or imparting grace to others. That is not what Gabriel is saying. Instead of understanding that that Mary gives out grace, we need to see her as an object of grace. That Mary receives God's grace just like you and me. Mary receives God's grace. Now before this encounter between Mary and Gabriel, there is no biblical, there's no scriptural evidence to conclude that Mary is something extra special. That's not what it means to be a recipient of God's grace, as though she was deserving of it, as though she had earned it. Grace is something given from God that is neither earned nor deserved. So with Mary, God has given the favor to one who had no claim to worthy status. He raised her up from a position of lowliness and has chosen her to have a central role in all of salvation's history. So the focus, we would be wrong if we read this passage and concluded that the focus of this passage is how special or how worthy or how holy or perfect or divine Mary is. 
The focus of this passage is on God and on His Son, Jesus Christ. The danger in moving the focus onto Mary is simply this. It's to think that she deserved to carry Jesus Christ. It's wrong to change the focus from God to Mary. So what we've got to do is to look at this passage and focus on the right thing and not focus on the wrong thing. It would be like if we went to the Grand Canyon. Have you been to the Grand Canyon? Have you seen the Grand Canyon? It would be like going to the Grand Canyon and then remarking at how nice the sky is. I mean, isn't this sky just so beautiful today? Right? You'd be focusing on the wrong thing. It would be like going to see one of those giant sequoia trees. You know, that's what? 200 feet tall? I might be making it up. They might, you know, 1,000 feet tall? I don't even know. So be going to see a giant sequoia tree and remarking at how amazing the forest floor looks. Right? You have this giant tree and you're just saying, wow, the ground is so nice today. You'd be focusing on the wrong thing. You could drive out to the mountains of Colorado, right? You could drive out west just into the beautiful and majestic mountains of Colorado and marvel at how nice the road is. Like, isn't this such a nice road? It's paved and, and flat. Isn't that amazing? But if you were to do that, marvel at the sky at the Grand Canyon, be amazed at the forest floor of a giant sequoia, or drive through the mountains and wonder at God's beautiful gift of I-70. You just, this is amazing. Your focus. I mean, those things are probably true. Are they not? I mean, the sky of the Grand Canyon is probably pretty. The road through the mountain is probably nice. The floor of a giant sequoia, the forest floor, is probably something. But you would simply be focusing on the wrong thing. And that's what we would be doing here today. If we read this passage and we just said, oh, I'm so blown away by Mary. And instead, miss out on the miracle of God deciding that He's going to come down to this earth come as a person, as a baby, be formed, created in Mary's womb, willing to leave just the majesty of heaven and the exaltation of being God in God's realm. If we miss out on that, we focus entirely on the wrong thing. Let's focus on the incredibility of a God that loves His creation so much that He decided to enter it in order to fix it. That's got to be our focus today. The Christmas story. The Christmas story is not so much about shepherds. It's not so much about angels who have harked. It's not so much about wise men who walked. It's definitely not about a drummer boy. The amazing thing about Christmas is the story of God deciding to enter creation directly and personally. That's what we have to marvel at today. Mary brings nothing on her resume than her availability and willingness to serve. But those characteristics are the ones that God needs the most out of His people. And so God puts Mary to use in His plan, taking her through a process which she's not prepared for. Mary is the epitome. She is the epitome of how we are to respond to God when God calls us into action. And we're going to look more at that in a moment. But first, let's look exactly, exactly how does God enter into creation? So while the announcement setting in the person of Mary is simple, the miracle is great. Everything in this passage rests on God's fresh, creative power. In entering creation, we see yet again that nothing, nothing is beyond God's power. Gabriel explains in verses 30 through 33 that Mary will give birth to Jesus, who will be 
the Son of the Most High God and will reign on the throne of David. Now, in verse 34, Mary asks this sort of million-dollar question of this passage. She asks how, especially because she is a virgin. And it's at this point that we have to acknowledge there may be some in this room who have a hard time with this idea. There may be some who are here who are saying, you know what? I'm not quite so sure I believe in the virgin birth. You may struggle with believing that as a virgin, Mary gave birth to God's Son. But when talking about God's creative power, about His ability to do the miraculous, we need to understand that this is God's M.O. And even we need to understand what M.O. stands for, right? Because sometimes people use acronyms without even knowing what they mean. I mean, M.O. does not stand for mode of operation. That's moo, right? That's not M.O. I had a friend that I had to go to and say, buddy, you are using a wildly inappropriate acronym in your text message because I don't think you know what it means. M.O. means modus operandi. It's Latin, and it means someone's habit. For example, I like to use Latin phrases to sound smart. That is my modus operandi. Doing the miraculous is simply God's MO. He regularly does the miraculous. So if believing in the virgin birth for you is hard, I, I get it. But consider, just consider, that this is simply God being God. This is what God does. To believe in the virgin birth is on par with believing that God raised Jesus from the dead. If you have no problem with the thought that God raised Jesus from the dead, you should have no problem with the virgin birth. To believe that God entered through a virgin, entered this world through the virgin, is on par with believing that Jesus took a pathetic amount of loaves and fish and he fed thousands. God's M.O. is to do the miraculous. It's on par with believing that Jesus can hear a paraplegic. It's on par with believing that Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead. It's on par with believing that Jesus can command the storms to cease. If Jesus can do that, God is capable, fully capable, of putting himself into the womb of the Virgin Mary. God is entirely capable of the miraculous because nothing is beyond God's power. Now to explain this to Mary, to explain this miracle to Mary, Gabriel points to the fact that Elizabeth is pregnant even in her old age. Elizabeth and Zechariah were unable to have kids, Gabriel explains. So if God is capable of giving a child to an infertile couple, God must be able to create in Jesus, to create in Mary, God's Son. This is true throughout Scripture. Sarah, who's the wife of Abraham. Rebecca, who's the wife of Isaac. Rachel, who's the wife of Jacob, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob fame. Hannah, the eventual mom of Samuel. And Elizabeth are all recorded in Scripture as unable to have kids, and yet these four women stand as pillars of our faith. These four women, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, Hannah, are all pillars of our faith. We point to them, and we're amazed at what God was able to accomplish through them. Because God is the God of the infertile. This is helpful. This is helpful for those of us who have experienced infertility. I don't know if you know our story, but Janet and I experienced this ourselves. After years, after years of infertility, we adopted Parker. And as a surprise, eight months later, a little bit too big of a surprise, Jonathan came along too. And since Jonathan was born, we are experiencing what is called secondary infertility. The inability to get pregnant for a second time. So we know the pain. We know that pain. The pain that Hannah felt. The pain that Elizabeth felt. That Sarah, 
Rebecca and Rachel endured. The pain of wanting to have a child. And there's some in this room who are enduring those very same pain. The pains of wanting a baby, yet maybe struggling with infertility. Let me talk to you. You're not alone. Or you may know somebody. You may know a child or a grandchild or a friend, a colleague or a coworker who so wants to have a baby, but for whatever reason, God is withholding that. Let me just say, if that's you, Janet and I are willing to be with you, to encourage you as you endure it. And even more important than us, than, than, than Janet and I, is that God is a God of the infertile. God is a God of the infertile. He can answer your prayers. He did it for us twice. Actually, He did it for us once and then answered the prayer that we never prayed and gave us two, which at the time was quite enough. More than enough. Nothing is beyond God's power. So if you're here today and you're saying, you know what, I'm not struggling with infertility, but sickness cancer, loss, unemployment, grief, uncertainty. Just know, know that nothing is beyond God's power. Nothing at all, whether it is your sickness, whether it's your pain, whether it's your loss, your grief, your uncertainty of the future, nothing is beyond God's power. He is the God who listened to the prayer of Hannah, who listened to her as she stood at the temple. She knelt on the steps and she prayed her heart out. She was so passionate in her prayer that people thought she was drunk. And yet God heard her prayer and he answered her prayer. God is able to do the impossible. Nothing is beyond his power. What stands in the way more often than not is our willingness to go to Him and to ask Him to answer our prayer. Now look back at me. Look back with me at verse 38. And let's read again Mary's incredible response to all that Gabriel has shared with her. He said, Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it, to be, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So we, we're, we may just look at this and say, you know what? That's just the most natural thing. And when we do so, we would miss out on Mary's quiet heroism. Mary could not be sure that she would not have to suffer, perhaps even die. But she re recognized the will of God, and she completely accepted it. In her quiet heroism, willing to do all that God asks her to do, Mary risks it all. I've not seen the movie yet, and I'm not sure that you, that you really have to to know what happens, because uh, the trailers help you out with that, uh, as they, sometimes they do, right? Trailers, movie trailers, just kind of do this for you sometimes. But the movie trailers of Hacksaw Ridge, if they're to be believed... There was a young man, a young soldier in World War II who risked his life to save his comrades. His name was Desmond T. Doss. He was a medic, and at great danger to his own life, he rescues, and this is all in the trailer, so don't blame me for spoiling the movie, he rescues 75 injured and dying soldiers. In doing so, in doing so, he risks it all. There was no white flag from the Japanese to allow him to go out and do that. There would have been no hesitation from an enemy soldier to shoot him. He risks it all. And he does so for the most worthy of causes. As a young woman, pregnant before marriage, Mary was in great danger. In being pregnant, and I mean, can you just even imagine, hey dad, um, I'm pregnant, but it's God's son. 
so you can't be mad. Right? Could you imagine? No, I'm, I swear, Dad, I'm still a virgin. Joseph and I haven't done anything, uh, and yet I'm pregnant. How likely do you think her parents were to believe her? Even the most trustworthy of young women, how likely were they to believe her? I mean, not at all. Do you imagine Joseph's family? Joseph's family goes to Joseph and says, Mary's pregnant, and Joseph said, I had nothing to do with it, Mom and Dad. How do you think Mom and Dad would have responded? Get rid of her. Leave her. Divorce her. Don't have anything to do with that woman. Could you imagine? And that's today, let alone 2,000 years ago. Imagine the people in her village. Imagine the rabbi in her village. Do you think he believed her? Do you think her friends believed her? Do you think her teachers believed her? Do you think her family believed her? Do you think her future mother-in-law believed her? I don't. I would imagine that she had to endure great ostracism, the threat of divorce, and maybe even death. Because if Joseph was okay with it, if Joseph had given it the green light, she could have been killed. Knowing this, knowing all of this, because Mary knew it, Mary knows it as Gabriel is standing before her and saying, you're pregnant, and you had nothing to do with it. Mary, those thoughts are going through her mind. What's going to happen next? And yet, and yet, she says, let it be to me according to your word. She's, we just have to marvel at that. Be amazed at her response. In the middle of all this drama stands Mary, who is God's listening, humble, willing servant who comes to see that God has the power to bring His plan to pass. So Mary has the model attitude. She is the perfect believer. God can do great things for His cause and can use anyone or anything to accomplish it. And Mary is ready and willing to be such a person. Earlier, I said we, we have to ensure that we don't elevate Mary to this sort of, right? We don't want this, this uh, marble to swing out too far one way. So we don't want to elevate her divine status and say that she gave grace. But we also, we can't, uh, as we, you know, sort of Protestants are prone to do, just sort of dismiss her as a nobody. As just sort of a body who carried the baby and there was nothing more. Her response to Gabriel's news, her willingness to serve in such a way is nothing short of exemplary. Mary's response is what we should strive towards. Oh, that we would all respond in the same way when God calls us. Her willingness is inspiring. It's the very thing that every Christian should be willing to follow. So let me ask you, Let me ask you, what has God called you to do? What has God called you to do? Where is God sending you? Who does God want you to help? What burden has God placed on your heart to address? What is He telling you to go and to do, to live and to share? Wherever. What has God called you to do? What breaks your heart? What pain do you want to see brought comfort in this world? Because without a doubt, God has called each of us to something, to somewhere, to serve some place. So let me ask you, where has He called you? And what has been your response? What has been your response? When is it time to finally surrender to his prodding? You will not have a Gabriel. You will not have a Gabriel who will appear to you 
in your living room. I'm sorry. That's just not going to happen. But there is something that burdens you. There's some place that breaks you. There's some need that you know that needs to be addressed. There is some calling that God has placed on your life. There is somewhere He is sending you to go. There is someone He wants you to tell. And what has been your response? Have you said, like Mary, may it be done to me according to God's will? Are you willing to risk it all? To go, to love, to share, to lead, to fix? What has God called you to do? And have you done it? Have you done it? How have you responded? This is the thing that we look at and we marvel at in Mary's response and say, Mary, may I have the same response as you. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for the miracle the absolute miracle that you decided to come to this earth in the form of Jesus Christ in order to save us from our sin. We thank you that miracles are your mode of operation, your willingness to do whatever, and so you enter into this world to save us, to fix us, to help us. And Lord, if there's anybody here who is struggling and in pain, I pray that they give them to You. Because nothing is impossible with You. But Lord, You have called us. You have sent us. You have burdened us. And I pray that we will respond in the same way as Mary. It's in Your name that we pray. Amen. Let me ask for you to stand. God goes to great lengths to save people. In Romans 5, 8, God tells us that He demonstrated His own love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus is willing to leave heaven enter a womb, endure childhood, all to go to the cross for our behalf. Because we all sin. We all make mistakes. And the penalty for those mistakes is death. And a separation from God. But Jesus died on the cross to pay that penalty so that those who believe in Him will no longer be separated from God. Let me invite you to believe in Him today. We'll be standing down front. Your pastors will be standing down front. If you would like to pray, if you need a reminder that there is nothing impossible, that nothing is impossible with God, if you need that reminder in prayer today, we'll be down here ready, willing, and eager to pray with you. Or these stairs are open to remind you of that fact. You can pray at these steps and say, God, I need that reminder that nothing is impossible with you. We'll also be down here for those who would like to join this wonderful church. We're also here for those who want to believe in Jesus Christ. Don't believe, don't anyone in this room believe that you're too old. This week, uh, we had the privilege to lay to rest my grandfather. And I didn't know this. I assumed he was, you know, at VBS at seven years old and he gave his life to Christ. What I was surprised with was that he was 32. At the time, uh, my dad was a teenager. At the time that my grandfather became a believer in Jesus Christ. 
you're never too old to believe in Him. And what peace we had, what peace we had in gathering together as a family, what peace we had that knowing that today He is in heaven. He's healed. He's restored. He's healthy. He can hear. What peace we have knowing that He's in heaven and this peace is available to you today if you believe in Jesus Christ. Foster it. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Shall we pray? Precious Father, I praise you for this time of year. I praise you, Father, for your Son who gave us, who gave all for us. I praise you, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would be with us as your body, as those, dear Father, who place their trust their love and their hope in you. As we come to this time of offering, I pray, Father, that you would help each of us, dear Father, to, to consider the things that we have been given by you and that we, dear Father, would share that with others with you, we would give it back, Father. You've given us so very much. I pray, Father, that you would be with each person who is here. Bless them, Father, for their time. Help us, Father, to honor you in our gifts. I praise you in the name of your Son. Amen. Well, it is good to be in the Lord's house today. Amen? It's been such a great honor our family has had to come and be a part of this church family. And part of that honor has been serving with some great fellow staff members. And in staff meeting this, wheel, this week, uh, Uncle Bill, as we call him in the office, Mark and I, Uncle Bill, Uncle Bill reminded me, he said, Bryce, at the end of the service, when you're standing there talking, everybody's really wanting to go to the buffet line. So keep it short. So, so that's my goal this week is to keep it short. So uh, just a quick reminder, uh, in your bulletin, uh, we have all the announcements there. So whatever I kind of go over quickly are in your bulletins, also in our weekly emails. Uh, but this Friday night, we have a great opportunity for all those families. Family night. Uh, this is the movie night featuring Polar Express. Uh, we are going to open the doors at 6 o'clock in the chapel. The movie will start at 6.30. Uh, we want to be a little different than the movie theater, right? The movie theater, you go in, it's dark. 
you sit there, you eat your popcorn, you take your drink, and you don't really socialize with those around you. Normally in a movie when somebody's talking, you, what, you throw something at them, right? You throw popcorn at them. We don't want that, right? We are the church family. We want an opportunity to fellowship together. So we're going to do that for about 30 minutes before the movie starts, okay? Six o'clock Friday night in the chapel. It's been in the gym before. We're changing that up a little bit. It's six o'clock in the chapel, family movie night featuring Polar Express, okay? Also, another event for young families. We are going to have milk and cookies with the pastor, all right? This is going to be something kind of new. I've, I don't think he's going to dress up in a Santa outfit, so I, I think we'll be all right. But we're going to have milk and cookies with the pastor Sunday, December the 18th. It'll be from 4 to 6 o'clock. Now, here's what we're asking of you, okay? If you have children that are in the preschool or elementary ages, you are welcome to attend with your children, okay? This is not Pastor Mark's babysitting service. Um, he and his wife would appreciate for you staying. And what we're doing is from 4 to 6, we have four 30-minute slots, okay? There's a sign-up sheet at the kind of the table outside next to the library. If you would just sign up your family in one of those time slots, we'll contact you, make sure you have all the details, all the information. Uh, but we'll just look forward to that. It'll be a great time with some, some, obviously some snacks, some story, and some prayer. It'll be a great time for the families of our church. And also, I really want to make up, uh, make an apology. Last week, I made a horrible mistake, and I forgot to announce one of our new members. Uh, last week, Miss Marcia Burstens came to join. Uh, you may recognize that name. She's our city ward representative. And so as I was going to her afterwards, I apologized. And then the first words out of her mouth to me were roll tide. And at that point, I went, oh, man, God's grace is sufficient, is it not? We even allow Alabama fans and graduates into our midst. So I'm going to ask her to come down at the front at the end of the service. We've got a few more things this morning. But at the end, if you would just come welcome her. She's joining from a sister church in our, in our community. We want to welcome her, and I apologize for omitting her last week. And last, before I turn it over to Pastor Mark for some brief business, um, if you're uncomfortable walking the aisle, if you're not comfortable coming down while the music's playing, you just want to have a conversation with one of the pastors, at the end of the service, Mark and I and Bill will be down front for just a few moments. Just come speak with us. We want to make sure that everyone here has the ability to know for sure that they are a child of the King. We want to make sure that we all can risk it all. So maybe it's salvation, maybe it's church membership, maybe it's a call to missions, whatever it is, if you're uncomfortable walking an aisle and you'd rather talk to us in a little more quiet setting, we'll be down here at the end of the service and would welcome to visit with you. Pastor Mark. It was probably the first business meeting that I was ever sad that I missed, but this last Wednesday, I'm sorry that I wasn't able to be here. Um, but at this time, I'd like to call us into uh, a special called business time. Guess, if you will, just endure for just a moment. This will be quick, I promise. Uh, the purpose of this time is to approve uh, the 2017 budget. We will not have discussion on it uh, since that was held this past Wednesday night. So consider ourselves uh, called into business. All I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for a verbal vote, yays or nays. So let me ask you, if you are in favor of approving the budget for 2017, would you say yay? yay. If you're approved, say nay. Uh, if you <laughs> disapprove, say nay. The yeas have it. Thank you. Foster? I have a favor to ask everybody. Last thing, I promise. Last thing. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, December 10th, the entire music and worship team is going to be getting together at the Aurora Mall, just right over here, at 6 o'clock to have a flash mob. Uh, this is uh, just a, in an effort to advertise uh, not only our Christmas production, but our sermon series, Love Came Down. You may be asking yourself, What's a flash mob? Well, let me, I, I can tell you right now what a flash. Do 
Beautiful. That was awesome. <laughs> that is a flash mob. And that's what we're going to be doing this coming Saturday, December uh, 10th at 6 o'clock at the Aurora Mall. If you would like to be a part of that, please join us on Wednesday. We're going to rehearse just a couple of uh, simple Christmas carols. And remember, this is not about do I have a good voice or not. This is about how much do you want them on the outside of these walls to join us, not only for the Christmas production, but ongoing through our sermon series and just join the church in general. How much do you want that? Can I, can I hear that? Please stand with us as we sing Joy to the World. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive a king. Let every heart prepare in room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Merry Christmas. Have a great week. <laughs>